All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm Eve Samples. I'm executive director at Friends of the Everglades. We have a, an important live discussion for you here today on some really uh, vital news to our communities about Lake Okeechobee discharges. And I'm going to introduce our guests in just a moment. First, I want to tell you why we're doing this. Uh, these are our clean water conversations. We launched these back in April after COVID kind of shut down in-person engagement on clean water issues. This is actually our seventh discussion and we have some really informed on the ground experts today to talk about Lake Okeechobee discharges. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce John Cassani. He's the Calusa water keeper and has a wealth of information for us about what's going on in the Caloosahatchee estuary. He's been at it for many years and is gonna give us some insights in terms of what the current Lake Okeechobee discharges are doing on that part of the state right now and what they've done in the past and what the solutions are as we look forward to the future. So welcome, John. Thank you, Eve. Mike Connor is the Indian River Keeper and Mike has worn a number of hats in terms of looking out for the Indian River Lagoon and St. Lucie Estuary over the years. He's been conservation editor at Florida Sportsman and also just involved with the local water warriors. And we're happy to have you here today, Mike, welcome. Thanks for having me, thanks so much. Pleasure. Ronaldo Diaz is the Lake Worth water keeper, and we're really grateful to have you here today, Ronaldo, because the Lake Worth Lagoon sometimes gets short shrift when we talk about Lake Okeechobee discharges and the impact that that pollution can have on the Lake Worth Lagoon. You bring a really vital voice to this conversation because Palm Beach County is impacted by this pollution, and you're going to tell us why. So welcome, Ronaldo. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So before we get into some of the nitty gritty of what's going on right now, since the Army Corps of Engineers started discharges from Lake Okeechobee last week on October 14th, I think it's important to talk a bit about the background of this issue. Um, so I'm gonna ask Allie Preston, who's our director behind the scenes, to pull up uh, my screen so that we can show some of that right now. So this, this slide is an, an oldie but a goodie, and it shows the historic flow on the left in Florida from the Kissimmee River, really current Orlando area, down to Lake Okeechobee, slowly down to the Everglades. And in the middle there is the current flow, and this is what we're dealing with right now. When Lake Okeechobee gets too high for the comfort level of the Army Corps of Engineers, discharges from the lake occur to the east. That's that arrow on the right. And the west, that's that arrow on the left, that's the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee estuaries, instead of meandering south. And on the far right is the envisioned restored flow that we've been talking about in Florida for decades and have not quite achieved. So this, this map looks like a whole bunch of arrows. I know Mike and John and Ronaldo, you guys look at this map a lot, um, but I just wanna highlight briefly what's important here. This was from this morning. And as of this morning, right here where my cursor is, I'll use my pointer so everyone can see it better. S77 is the gate that discharges from Lake Okeechobee to the Caloosahatchee. And that 4,096 is cubic feet per second. That's a lot of water flowing that way right now. And then on the east side toward the St. Lucie River at S308, we have 324 cubic feet per second coming out of the lake into the C44 canal. But more importantly, at this S80, where the canal meets the St. Lucie River, we have 1,381 cubic feet per second flowing our way. This is polluted Lake Okeechobee water. There has been algae on the lake in recent days, and it, this really poses a risk to our community. And finally, I want to point out this S352. It's at zero right now, but Reynaldo is going to tell us later why this is a really important structure for the Lake Worth Lagoon. Um, so cubic feet per second is kind of abstract, but uh, one of the colonels from the Army Corps described it in a way recently that kind of brought it to life for me. Think about that many footballs flying past you every second. A, a gallon or a cubic foot is about a, the size of a football. So we've got 4,096 footballs per second flying into the Kusahatchee River. So that's, that's not good. And we're going to talk about why. This is what it looks like coming out of the gate at the St. Lucie locks. Uh, this was last week. It's a little bit heavier now. And this is to the west at the Franklin Lock and Dam. And also this is heavier now than it was when we took this picture. 
So I'm, I'm gonna hand it over to John. John, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about what the conditions are looking like in the Caloosahatchee right now. It's been a week since the Army Corps started discharges. You're taking about 2.6 billion gallons a day on average, more than twice as much as the St. Lucie. Describe what we're seeing in, on that side of the state right now. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So I, I think keeping our eye on the target in terms of ecological impacts, you know, we're really concerned about how much freshwater inflow is occurring from the Franklin Lock, that's S79. So we're getting about 4,000 from the lake and we're getting about two, about 3,000 CFS from the basin for a total of about seven, a little over 7,000 CFS at the Franklin Lock. We know the harm level is about 2,800 cubic feet per second or footballs per second. Uh, that's about two and a half times the harm level. So we went from kind of moderate basin inflow up until uh, October 14th, uh, but now that's a little more than doubled. Uh, obviously it varies every day depending on rainfall. So the situation right now is, is that we're getting uh, a lot of highly stained panic water uh, from both the basin and the lake, and it's just too much. So there's two problems there. One is we're getting too much fresh water, which compresses the estuary. Basically, it flushes it out with fresh water. That creates problems for some of the biota there, like blue crabs, bay anchovy, snook. All these species have larvae and eggs in the estuary now. So if they're getting blown out by the freshwater uh, inflows, that's a problem. You can add spotted sea trout to that and oysters or a couple others. So pretty big impacts to reproductive uh, outcomes as a result of these flows. The other problem is the water is extremely tannic. Um, so what that means is it's very brown and we've seen this sort of evolution from a tea colored uh, brown water to something that almost resembles black coffee. Uh, scientists sometimes refer to that as brownification and that results from these organic compounds that come into the basin and into the estuary uh, from stormwater runoff. So uh, the problem there is, is that it shades the seagrass. And the other really important thing that it does, in addition to an ecosystem impact, that it lowers property values. We know from a, a report that the Florida Association of Realtors did back in 2015, if water transparency increases by one foot in Lee County or uh, Martin County on the Clusahatchee or the St. Lucie, property values increase by $540 million just with a one foot change in water transparency. So if you walked out into the Clusahatchee right now, uh, if you walked out into knee deep water, you probably couldn't see your feet. It's so black as a result of this brownification or this highly tannic water. So that's, that's a big concern to a lot of people, especially on the coast. So that pretty much sums it up. You, you saw that one image and it looks like from what our pilot uh, recorded yesterday, looks like the tar that dark water plume goes at least five miles offshore. Uh, and I don't think we even determined the westward extent of that dark water plume. So we know it's having significant effects, not only in the estuary, but you know, the near coastal and back bay areas as well. Question for you on that, John. So you can see this line here that you're talking about, the plume coming out. And I know we've had a lot of clouds lately across Florida, so it's not quite as clear as we've seen in other pictures. Did you see much of a plume prior to the Lake Okeechobee discharges starting last week? Was, was there a plume resulting from local runoff as far as you know? Yeah, that's a good comparative question, Eve. And, and yes, there has been some, some moderate inflows from the basin. It is a dark water and we've seen a little bit of a, a transition over the last couple of months to where we're seeing more of this dark water. So the reason you don't see a lot of contrast in this image is because most of the summer we've been getting this dark water entering the estuary and the near shore areas. If you were to see it when it first came in, then you'd see more contrast and it would be more evident. But it's, it's totally flush 
uh, flush the nearshore areas with this dark tannic water. Um, so, you know, it's we're kind of at the end of the rainy season, and this is probably the worst manifestation of that that you're going to see right now. So, so to be completely unscientific in my terminology, we're getting really crappy water on top of crappy water, so there's not as much of a delineation. Well, we're getting more volume now, so it's not just some dark water. We're getting about twice as much dark water as we have been getting on average as a result of the lake discharges. Gotcha. So this is an image I grabbed from the news press. One of their photographers, Andrew West, went out and took some shots this week. I saw, and, and you can really see it from the shore here, and, and you can certainly understand why that would impact property values when the water looks like that. So thanks for that that kind of on the ground report, John. Um, I, I also want to ask Mike to describe for us what you're seeing on the Indian River Lagoon side of the state, Mike Connor. Um, you know, we're not getting the volume. I'm in Stewart, so I'm here too. We're not getting the volume that the Caloosahatchee River is, but it's really not good. So I'm going to click to one of the slides that you shared with me, Mike, and ask you to describe how these Lake Okeechobee discharges that started last week are impacting the St. Lucie River, which of course connects to the Indian River Lagoon. Yeah, <clears throat> you pretty much a, a mirror image of our sister estuary on the West Coast. Uh, we're a very small river our watershed in, in comparison with the Caloosahatchee. Uh, so, you know, half the discharge here, it, it's pretty damaging because we are small. We have a small river, you know, and it does influence the Southern IRL as well. We've had a real wet winter, a summer, I'm sorry. And our estuary, um, in uh, 23 years I've lived here, I haven't seen the estuary in such bad shape without Lego discharges. And that was all the runoff. We know we're, we're the uh, unfortunate recipients of a lot of flow from inland through other canals. And, you know, folks here that live here know uh, the North Fork has three canals, which dump into the St. Lucie from, you know, the canals extend all the way out to inland farm areas. Uh, a lot of water users, big landowners. So those canals come through a residential tidal basin as well. So we add to that here with our storm water. But those canals originate way out west. And they're not unlike the C44 in, in that way because there's so much land along those canal banks. All that runoff gets into those canals all summer long. We had days of summer, Eve, where we had upwards of two to three billion gallons coming into this estuary per day just between the C23, 24, 10 Mile Creek, and C44, which connects the lake to our estuary. Uh, the lake hasn't been open, but that's pretty, that's pretty daunting numbers, and it sure shows. Our, our salinity has been down for quite some time. We've had low salinity in the Middle River, like downtown Stewart, as low as today. It's one part salt on a falling tide. But we had a lot of days in the past month of the salinity in the Middle River is barely five. That's a lot of stress on oysters and other organisms, uh, seagrasses as well, out by the crossroads where the IRL joins the St. Lucie inside the inlet. Uh, the lake though discharges just exasperate the whole thing. Uh, we have more flow now. Uh, actually, this morning, according to what I'm looking at, the data, we're getting about 2.3 billion per day if you do the calculation from CFS right now at the S80. The lake is closed at this hour. It changes hour to hour. And, you know, the Colonel Kelly on a call the other day talked about this being a pulse release regimen. Uh, I used to think pulse release meant you'd get a few days off, four or five days off. And now this is like, it's not to me, it's not really a pulse release that gives the estuary any time to recover in any way, shape, or form. It's just an off-on spigot. And, it, you know, there's no way we can expect any recovery uh, anywhere in the river or Southern IRL around sailors with this schedule they're on right now. Um, so here we are. We're here. We were, we were like we're in the last and fourth quarter of the football game. We thought they had a game one. And then they turned this on. And uh, the, lake, the lake has risen since yesterday, 16.32 elevation. Uh, there's inflow coming in from the north about, I think it's uh, upwards of 5,000 right now. So it, it's going to rise more in a couple of days. And, uh, you know, at this point, we're just hoping that they look at it a week from now and say, OK, this we've stemmed the rise of the lake. Hopefully they will. And look at the estuary conditions. Uh, we're going to lose our oysters. I can't imagine there's many live oysters alive in the upper estuary at all. It's been so fresh for so long in the South Fork. It's, it's a moot point, I'm sorry to say. The oyster, oysters we put in and introduce, it's just a shame this happens. Uh, it's been two years since our last major discharge. We've had a little bit of recovery, um, seagrass-wise, out by the crossroads. Nothing, nothing dramatic. 
trust me. It hasn't been a lot of folks are seeing what they think is seagrass. A lot of it's macroalgae, different things that are not as good a habitat as the real grasses we expect to have here. Manatee grass, shoal grass. That photo right there, I took that two days ago, Middle River area, right by Hell's Gate. That is about two and a half miles inside the inlet. That's near the crossroads of the IRL and the St. Lucie. Um, that's, that is the day before the discharge started from the lake. So you can already see we have really compromised water without the discharges. And I'll be looking at this area later on this afternoon, and I can only imagine. Um, you can see the difference in the color. What really concerns us as well is that unlike the C44 canal and the canals in our north estuary, Lake O brings muddier water. And Lake O brings that sediment into our estuary. Uh, clouds out the seagrass, even worse, covers things. It settles in the river, adds to the muck layer, which has been growing over the decades. And uh, this is a picture on your screen of oysters that a good friend of mine snagged while fishing for snook at the Roosevelt Bridge on the bottom. And they're all tight shut oysters, live oyster cluster. Uh, I have to wonder now, today, are those oysters alive at this point? And that was that was two years ago or last year, Mike, the oysters? Um, this photograph was taken about six months ago. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, so and so with salinity levels down, we wonder, will these survive? Yeah, wonder, but months yeah. and months of low salinity, as, as slow as zero at times, um, if those oysters have survived this. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that description. You know, what we're seeing in the St. Lucie River and the Clusahatchee is nowhere near like what we saw in 2018 because these discharges started late, later. But I found that to be really thin comfort. Uh, we shouldn't be getting these discharges from the lake during the rainy season at all. We know the risk they pose and, and there are solutions system wide. And I know we've all been working on those and we're going to talk about them in a bit. But first, Ronaldo, I'd like for you to describe the very different situation that the Lake Worth Lagoon faces. So here's here's a map. You all can see the Lake Worth Lagoon on the far east side here. Tell us about what you're seeing and your part of the system. Sure. Um, yeah, the, the Lake Worth Lagoon as a watershed is definitely a lot more complicated than uh, the other two northern estuaries. And that kind of leads us to some unique challenges in terms of how it's managed. Um, you can see like on the map, the, the western half, there's those three conveyances, if you will. Um, the one that, uh, that's an easy focus is the one that's right in the middle, that spillway 352, which is in Canal Point, uh, connects to the L10 Canal. Um, and that eventually uh, leads to the northern tip of the refuge or water conservation area one with the other two conveyances. Um, and that kind of, you know, that, that brings this level of complexity, uh, like for example, the L8 canal, that structure on the lake is the C10A, that one generally, including right now is going into the lake, not out of it. Um, and to add more confusion, you know, as those three converge onto the refuge, some of that water or most of that water will get sent south into the STA and then into the refuge. Uh, but then sometimes and often uh, a, a significant amount of that water is gonna go due east uh, down to C51 Canal and into the Lake Worth Lagoon. Um, one, one thing that works against the Lake Worth Lagoon is unlike the other Northern estuaries, historically it wasn't always a coastal estuary. I mean, you're talking, you look back 150 years ago, if that, um, the lagoon was actually more of a freshwater lake. It was landlocked. It was part of the chain of lake systems. And because of that, because of its history, it's depending on what policy you're looking at, it's not always defined as a coastal estuary. And that kind of confusion, that complexity to it works against the lagoon in that uh, depending on, you know, some, uh, uh, depending on what definition you're using, if you're using the legal definition of a northern estuary, uh, at times we often see like you started with that core de uh, graphic describing, you know, south discharging. Well, according to that graphic, sending water south also includes sending water east towards the Lake Worth Lagoon. Um, so it's not always genuine uh, in mm -hmm. terms of what the numbers are being depicted there. This picture right here is from the lake side of the 352 spillway. That spillway is right smack in the middle of the EAA. It's right on the lake. Oh, this is looking from the Lake Okeechobee side. This picture was taken just a couple months ago. 
And it's really indicative of what this area looks like. This spillway, this is on the canal side, taken, uh, I believe, late July this year. Um, and this site is really important to us because this spillway uh, is often overlooked in terms of the conversation for cyanobacteria. And that's a problem because this is one of, if not the most popular fishing spot in the glades communities. Uh, we're talking sustenance fishing, fishermen. And this site, this is fr uh, from the canal underneath the railroad bridge, looking uh, you know, at the spillway, of course. And you know, I'm at this site regularly and it doesn't matter what the conditions are, there's almost always gonna be fishing there, even when the water is looking like split pea soup and it's looking you know, incredibly tragic and I'm still seeing people pull fish out of the water and putting it in their cooler. Um, and we're, what we see at this site is that every year in the summer, it gets stuck in, in this like positive feedback loop and that the bloom just kind of builds up to the point where it gives out, dies away, or, you know, like what we've had recently, a lot of rain. So the discharges actually help dissipate the bloom in this area. Uh, but then, you know, when the spillways close and the water becomes stagnant again, it just comes back and it gets stuck on this loop every year for months at a time at this site. So this is one of our, our focus areas on in terms of a study site and what we're looking at. Gotcha. So I'm glad you brought up cyanobacteria because we haven't really gotten into it yet. I'm gonna flip back to this picture. So we haven't seen widespread blue-green algae this summer, but you certainly saw it here when you captured this picture. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk about the dramatic impacts we saw in 2018 when we did see widespread blooms because even though we're not experiencing them this year the elements that could prompt them to return uh, still exist in many ways so john i'm, I'm going to turn it back to you and and before i do actually i want to remind our facebook audience and our youtube audience that if you have questions you can put them into the comments on facebook and we'll do our best to get to them toward the end of our conversation so please um let us know what you're thinking about so this was 2018 over in Southwest Florida near Sanibel, John. Lake Okeechobee discharges have been polluting the estuaries for decades, but Southwest Florida really reached a tipping point in 2018 when Lake O discharges triggered not only blue-green algae blooms, cyanobacteria, but also a, a really deadly red tide bloom coincided with them. So why were the conditions so acutely bad in 2018 and has anything really changed to prevent them from happening again? Yeah, so 2018 compared to now, uh, some similarities and some big differences. The 2018 event was precipitated to some degree, and keep in mind there was a massive microcystis bloom on the lake uh, that started as a result of some massive phosphorus loading to Lake Okeechobee. Uh, as a result of Hurricane Irma. So we saw about double the annual loading rate of uh, late 2017, 20, early 2018, which sustained that bloom, very severe bloom. Uh, the similarity is we're seeing uh, another microcystis bloom in the lake at this time. Uh, the discharges, the high volume discharges in 2018 didn't start until June 1st. Uh, and this year, unfortunately, they're not starting until October 14th, the end of the season. There's some similarities, some differences. We saw the same dark water plume uh, come in 2018 uh, ahead of some of the blooms. And we're seeing kind of the same thing this summer as well. So kind of a repeat of, of that portion. We haven't seen the massive cyanobacteria blooms in the estuary like we saw in 2018. Uh, so that's a big relief. Uh, I just got some news that there's some major uh, trichodesmium blooms off the coast of Sanibel right now. Uh, it's, it's possible those blooms are responding to this high volume discharge that's been occurring since the 14th. Um, so we'll just have to keep an eye on that and see how it goes. Can you explain exactly what that is, John, for folks who don't know? Yeah, trichodesmium is another type of cyanobacteria. It's, it's um, you know, it's one that fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. 
So there are other micronutrients that perhaps precipitate uh, the trichodesmium like iron. And we know a, a significant constituent of this brownification is iron. The Caloosahatchee River has high iron concentrations. Uh, we think that's the micronutrient that might be the trigger for the trichodesmium bloom that ultimately leads to a red tide uh, event in many cases. We're hoping that won't happen this year. If you're wondering where the iron comes from, we think it's from uh, over extraction of groundwater for agricultural irrigation in the basin. Groundwater is highly uh, mineralized, has high iron concentrations, and we see that as a, a, a pollutant to the Clusahatchee that's contributing to these harmful algal blooms. So there are elements or there are segments of the Clusahatchee that are impaired for iron. You add all the dissolved organics and the iron together, and then we get this, this ultra brown, uh, very dark brown water. It looks like root beer, basically. So it damages the ecosystem and it reduces property values uh, near the waterways. Mm -hmm. and, and we haven't even touched on the, the human health threat much uh, related to cyanobacteria in particular. So toxins in cyanobacteria can be linked to neurodegenerative diseases such as ALS, liver disease, I think there's been a real awakening over the last couple of years in Florida and, and a growing body of scientific evidence about the health impacts of these toxic algae blooms. And of course that brings really serious grave implications when you're talking about moving these blooms potentially into populated areas of Florida. So I'm gonna just click on that note to some images from Port Mayaca in 2018. I mean, these, these are the images, the kinds of images that got worldwide attention when Florida had guacamole, green water. And you can literally see those algae blooms flowing through the locks, the St. Lucie Spillway in 2018. So we know now because we have satellite imagery and we have folks who fly in the air and take pictures that those blooms can start in the lake and, and literally travel down the canals to our estuaries and that's not good. So Ronaldo, I wanna to turn to you and I'm hoping you can talk a bit about the role of the sugar industry, which carries incredible political weight in Florida and how sugar farms around the lake fit into this picture. I know that's a big question and we can all talk about it. And, and, and I hear the sirens behind you now. I hope we didn't trigger something. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, the role of sugar, the sugar industry and pollution, I, you can break it down into two sides, really. There's the, the physical, the actual pollution side of it. And then when we saw, you, you know, we saw the map of the Lake Worth Lagoon watershed, the western half, those three canals. Well, those three canals, especially the L10 right in the middle, cuts right through the EAA. So we're you know, half a million acres of sugar fields right there. And it's really important to understand how these fields are irrigated. It's not like uh, what most people think of when they see a farm on TV, like the big, you know, sprinkler systems that get wheeled, wheeled out and sprayed to fields. The way that these fields get irrigated in the EAA is they're actually, they're basically flooded with the lake water. So especially looking at that L10 canal uh, outside, connected to that canal are going to be a series of smaller canals that go out into the fields. And so uh, the way they irrigate is they're going to raise the water into those smaller canals until it covers the field, saturates the soil and so on. And then uh, when they need to remove that water, uh, like over the last few weeks, because right now, you know, as we all know, starting in October, they start burning the fields, they start harvesting. So in preparation for that, they're going to pull that water out of those little canals and bring it back into the main canals like the L10 canal. Got with, it. With that, of course, comes quite a bit of nutrient pollution. And then when that coincides uh, like it is right now uh, with discharging, it's going to bring all of that mess together uh, towards us and towards the STAs. Um, so there's that physical nutrient pollution side. And then there's also the, the C10A, which is on the northern edge of the EAA. And I pointed out that structure is often going into the canal. Um, you'll see it by looking at the core data or district data. It'll be designated by a negative number. Um, you know, you often like to hear, you often see these um, uh, reasons, if you will, or excuses or, or red herrings that are thrown out, one of which is like, 
you know, there's no back pumping into the lake. So water is only coming out of the lake and rarely does it go in. That's not entirely true, especially looking at the C10A, that water, you know, that structure is basically controlled by the water level on either side. So if you raise the water level on the canal side, then of course it's going to flow back into the lake. Um, and those three canals in the western half, the EAA half of our watershed, those pictures that you showed, I mean, we see that every year in that half of the watershed. And it's because of how that irrigation works. It's because of that movement of nutrients. Um, and so, you know, that covers the, uh, the actual polluting side. But then there's the other side of pollution, and it's the political influence, right? And then here in Palm Beach County, it's, it's just glaring at how uh, influential the sugar industry is. Um, they like to say, you know, that they're big employers in the community, and that's why they, they need so much importance. But even in the EAA itself, the number one employer is still the school district. It's not the industry, the sugar industry. Um, but, you know, despite that, they're, they have all this influence. And it's a problem for us in Palm Beach County because their influence, it's just so broad. It covers everything from even like the lowliest like soil and water district politicians to commissioners, town and county, all the way up to, you know, the highest level of state government, governor, it goes all the way. And then on top of that, you have the federal legislators who are all bought out. So in our community, when we want to try and push something that um, is going to benefit the Lake Worth Lagoon, which often, you know, in order to do that, we, we have to inevitably point out that most of the Lake Worth Lagoon's pollution is coming from the western half of its watershed. It's coming from the EAA. So they don't particularly care for that. So anytime something that's a good idea gets proposed is usually met up with a lot of resistance. Uh, it's right. really important to, to understand that like for the Lake Worth Lagoon, it's exceptionally important for us to address these concerns because our watershed or the lagoon itself, it's tiny. It's only 21 miles long. And at the most in some parts, it's about half a mile wide. And so that compared to the watershed itself, the land, we have an input ratio that is 42 to one. So that is, if you were to take one square mile of the lagoon, that means 42 square miles of land is being, uh, is being put into or flooded into the lagoon. Compare that to like the Indian River Lagoon, I believe is five to one. Uh, Biscayne Bay, I know is 11 to one, uh, which is probably more of a usual type of uh, input ratio. So the Lake Worth Lagoon being so small and having such a large watershed, it's taking a lot of this input that's being concentrated. Half of our watershed is from the EAA. So inevitably, when we talk about pollution going into the lagoon, we're going to have to talk about the sugar fields. And they have uh, their you know, political people, their politicians involved who are just going to be resistant to that idea. Yeah, the, the political influence is pretty immense. There was an interesting exchange yesterday at the meeting of the Rivers Coalition in Stewart and Jennifer Reynolds, who now works for the South Florida Water Management District, used to work for the Army Corps of Engineers, was asked why more water isn't moving south in the wet season. You see these are at zero right now, right? We, we're sending all this water east, all this water west, but these two um, toward the STAs, not not south toward the lagoon necessarily, but these two toward the STAs um, are at zero. So why isn't more lake water flowing through those? And the answer is because it's treating water from the Everglades agricultural area, which is mostly sugarcane. So there are stormwater treatment areas that taxpayers have paid for, and also the agricultural privilege tax has paid for but we're not getting anything out of them right at the moment. And why can't we use more capacity there though? So, so Mike, I know your, your video has gone in and out, but I think you can hear us now. I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about the, the changes and operations that could be helpful for the St. Lucie river and Indian river lagoon from your perspective. Um, you know, what kind of water policy changes are necessary? Yeah. And I hope I'm back on. I was kicked off twice. Maybe I hope I didn't say anything wrong. Um, you know, so <laughs> no, <we're here>. <laughs> Yeah, as far as, as operational changes, I was very uh, heartened to see uh, our local legislator here 
um, representative did uh, push for um, lower lake levels year round and starting the wet season uh, at a, well, you want to use an arbitrary number, but something around 11 feet. Some are advocating as low as 10 feet. Of course, we get a lot of blowback when we ask for that kind of uh, elevation from uh, water users, uh, the big stakeholders, the growers. Um, but I think that helped a bunch. We were kind of lucky when it did get implemented. Uh, it, I think the actual measure, the, the core came around, and I think they probably took about a half, maybe a half a foot off the lake manually but the rest was dry season really that happened a real good dry season which got it down and uh it's, it's good for the lake great for the estuary uh i, I think uh, you know we have to buy time with um with regulatory changes like that and managing the lake because projects are still i don't want to say light years away but they're still years away i mean they're really the projects we're hoping for are six to seven to eight years away, uh, with the exception of uh, maybe one project in western St. Lucie County for our local watershed. But as far as the lake discharges, uh, we've got to keep the lake lower, get capacity to hold the water once the rainy season starts. But again, the problem is those that want the water for irrigation, they're, they uh, they want that. The high lake is good for their business, and a high lake is bad for ours and bad for our health. And, you know, it's when you look at, when you look at the way the system was developed decades ago, the canals and C44, everything is built to drain the lake, keep land south of the lake dry, keep people safe, of course, the levee. But in the meantime, the coastal, the coasts have changed. We now have, between the two counties, upwards of a million people living in the area that are affected by the discharges. And that's, uh, that can't, this can't be the plan any longer. Um, so we're just hoping we get appropriations for the authorized projects in SERP. Um, and I know you're gonna go on to the EA reservoir eventually here, I won't jump there. But um, again, the, regu the regulation of the lake, manually keeping it lower year round is a real key for us. And some years it will work, in the wettest years, it may not make much difference. And we just had a wet end, we're having a wet end of the year, so we'll see, but, uh, and here we are with discharges. Yeah, back, looking back, we wish we had a little lower you know, yeah, it, but uh, it didn't work out that way. But, you know, the, the number 10 or 11, somewhere in there, it's it's really where it has to be uh, on June 1st. Thanks, Mike. John, I want to turn to you. I know you've been interested in using those STAs, stormwater treatment areas south of the lake for more lake water. So we're not in the position we're in right now. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and other solutions you see in terms of preventing discharges in the future? Yeah, so I, I guess the constraint right now about not moving more water south is that the SDAs and the conservation areas are at capacity. And, you know, I think there's somewhat of a misconception that some folks think that the reason they're at capacity is just from rainfall that falls directly on those areas. And I don't think that's entirely true. Um, so the district's moving water into the EAA and out of the EAA, and certainly a proportion of that is to uh, move water off the Everglades agricultural area crops. So, you know, that isn't just about flood control, folks. That's, that's partially about uh, creating optimal conditions for uh, the crops. And so uh, we're seeing a little bit of a shared adversity uh, problem there where the EAA is getting pretty much uh, optimal conditions uh, and they're filling up and contributing to the capacity of the, you know, the SDAs and the conservation areas. So we can't treat and move more water south as a result of that. So we need more equity. Uh, you know, I think at some point, you know, the, it, the, the, the agro industry and the EAA needs to share some adversity in terms of storing some of that water on those fields. We do appreciate and we do acknowledge the additional operational flexibility the Corps has been using to keep the lake lower and to try to minimize the high volume discharges. We, th we think that's good, but here we are again, you know, another year and probably 40 consecutive years of high volume discharges to the estuary. Um, you know, and, and the agro industry says, well, we're spending 11, $12 million a year uh, to help manage the STAs and the or um, the conservation areas, but the impact we're seeing as a result of these high volume discharges to the northern estuaries in, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So 
there's no really equity comparison between uh, the damage that's occurring to that, that agro industry versus what's happening on the coast. Giant inequity there. Need, that gap needs to be closed at some point. So uh, I, hope, I hope we can do that in a, a meaningful way. Uh, and again, you know, the additional operational flexibility is good, but again, we're getting high volume discharges. So we're not fixing the problem. Exactly. I know we all hoped we could avoid them in 2020 and things were looking good earlier in the year. And we just had such a wet late summer fall that it was, well, I don't want to say unavoidable because I do think we could have held off longer and we could have changed some operations. So uh, we've got to keep pushing for more. I, I want to talk about the EAA reservoir now. Um, this is a, a big project um, passed, approved in 2017 through Senate Bill 10 in the Florida legislature. This giant reservoir and stormwater treatment area south of Lake Okeechobee is going to help to some degree in terms of Lake Okeechobee discharges to the northern estuaries. It'll hold about 240,000 acre feet. So by my calculations, that's about 78 billion gallons. But at the current rate of discharge, just to the St. Lucie and Clusahatchee, we're sending 111 billion gallons over the month. So, um, you know, once that reservoir fills up, um, if we're not moving enough water south, will there be capacity? I have serious questions. We at Friends of the Everglades also are a little concerned about the depth of that EAA reservoir. It's supposed to be 23 feet. We're concerned it could create more algal blooms. So that's our take. Um, I want to hand it over to Mike to weigh in on, on what your thoughts about how much that giant $1.6 billion project is going to help. Well, um, at the outset, and uh, we were, you know, a lot of us were up in Tallahassee when Joe Negron was moving this bill through. Um, and the uh, original plan was for 60,000 acre project with uh, ample shallow water attenuation, shallow water FEB, you know, cleansing marsh with the reservoir uh, at, to be dynamic, dynamic in the sense where the, the water can be moved through, made room for more water, it would work around the clock every month. Well, as long as there was water to send there, it could send it south um, under the consent decree of 10 parts phosphorus. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful plan, but you know, it went through the meat grinder in Tallahassee and the, uh, the opposition um, really lobbied, as they always do, to, uh, they wouldn't sell us any land. They wouldn't give up any land. They, the district back then, the old district, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's such a, uh, our district now, our district board is, a, you know, world's better. Uh, the old district, I will tell you, they were supposed to go out and find willing sellers to make that project happen in the size spatially, and they did not lift a finger to find willing sellers. Uh, we had no evidence of them really working hard to do that. Ultimately, we got maybe one or two sellers that wanted to sell a couple acres, handful of acres to us for it. So what, we're, what we end up with is a project that is, you know, it's too small and too tall. <laughs> the uh, a big walled reservoir uh, like that wasn't the plan. It really wasn't. Um, it, the 80 billion gallons will help. You know, it's going to help. And, and, and they like to say in combination, with all the other CERT projects, it'll be effective. But it would have been three times more effective uh, if it were if we would get this through and had it appropriated uh, in the original size that Joe Negron uh, envisioned. So, um, yeah, the EA reservoir is going to happen. It's going to happen. I hope as long as we get appropriations every year, the money has to come through yearly. You know, the Water Resources Development Act, WERDA, WERDA's going to keep funding it too, if I'm not mistaken. But at this point, yeah, it's what we ended up with. Uh, um, better than nothing. I, I can't sound any more excited than that about it because I know what it was supposed to be in, in the outset. And we didn't get that project. But yes, it's going to be, be a big help. It'll be a big help on normal years. But on super, super successfully wet years, Eve, it's, it's, it's not going to stop the discharges. It won't mm -hmm. stop the discharges. Some of the other projects might help. They might, um, we might have to deal with discharges of a smaller scale, not so often. But at this point, our side and, and John's side, we, we've seen discharges 10 of the last 14 years. So mm -hmm. if we cut that in half, it will be a help because the estuary needs more than a couple of year cover each time out. So right. the reservoir is what it is. Um, I'm glad we had it. Could have been better, you know. Right. So not ideal. I, I do want to, before we 
talk more about the rules before I get to some of our Facebook questions. So here's one from Jason Pym, who's watching. He wants to know if Palm Beach County actually needs, uses Lake Go water for drinking water supply. They seem to trot that out every season as a reason for keeping the lake artificially high. Ronaldo, this is something I wanted you to talk about anyway. How do you respond to that when we talk about moving more water south during the dry months? <laughs> Well, I, I like uh, Jason's use of they. We know exactly who he's talking about. Um, so, you know, this is something that comes up every year, it seems like. And years and years ago, this was probably a legitimate concern. But since then, uh, you know, there was a year, probably a little over a decade ago, where we, we did come close and it was a concern. But I think since then, especially the county uh, has since adapted and, uh, you know, been prepared for that. Um, we get our water from various sources. Perhaps the most vulnerable is going to be city of West Palm and uh, the island of Palm Beach. Uh, indirectly, they actually purchase their water from the city of West Palm, but city of West Palm gets their water from surface water sources, a little bit from Laco, barely. Most of it comes from grassy waters preserved. And it's almost ironic that um, the people who are making this claim that you know our water supply is threatened uh, because of it uh, because they're right, our water supply will be threatened, but it's not in the way that they claim to be. The water supply that's threatened is, for example, grassy waters. And the way that grassy waters is threatened is one, there's encroaching development. You know, there's always that idea of pushing 441 to be built right next to it. But also, uh, you know, these uh, connections, uh, so grassy waters is connected to, um, to our watershed through uh, a canal called the M Canal, and that's what connects to, uh, it's it's the, the northernmost canal to L8 that goes up to that C10A. And so the threat that these uh, uh, the surface water source is facing, it's more from the pollution that's coming from the EAA and from the surrounding areas, not necessarily a quantity of water problem. Uh, the threat is in them opposing and re being resistant to CERT projects that need to happen so that we can make sure that our watershed gets clean water and quality water. And what I mean by quality water too is, you know, obviously we want, you know, less or no chemicals that they're using, um, but it also comes down to uh, the, the life-giving quality of this water. So like when the locks are closed and when the spillways are closed and when it's what we would call a low flow event, um, I've been now in EAA, those canals drop my meter in and dissolved oxygen, which is pretty much critical to, you know, life in the water, just as it implies it's oxygen. I've been in those canals uh, when it's only taking runoff from the EAA and dissolved oxygen has been down to like the 20% range, which is basically functionally dead. And so when you have this water sitting in those canals, whether it's filled with cyanobacteria or whether it's so polluted that dissolved oxygen has collapsed. And then all of a sudden you're gonna release that water into a place like gra gra grassy waters or the Lake Worth Lagoon. Um, you know, it's not gonna benefit us in any way. Uh, like John had mentioned earlier about the brownification of water, we're seeing that as well. This is really low grade water. And then when you uh, flush it into a sensitive natural area like grassy waters, which happens to also be the surface water supply of the town of West Palm Beach, then you're really risking um, a serious compromise there of having things like grass die-offs, having entire you know habitats collapse because of it. And that risk comes not from the amount of water that we're drawing out of it or the, the amount of water that's being recharged into it. That risk comes from the pollution that goes in there which comes from uh, all these sugar operatives and politicians who oppose good projects every step of the way. You know, Mike mentions about like, we want a bigger and shallower reservoir and they say, well, it'll work in conjunction with other projects. And it's like, yeah, that's true. Except that those other projects are also gonna be severely compromised by them once it goes through Tallahassee and DC. Yeah, we, we have a long history of over compromising in Florida and also unintended consequences. So, John, I want to ask you for your take on the restoration projects that are 
in the works now. So you guys have the C43 reservoir on your coast, and we also have been talking about the EAA reservoir. How hopeful are you that these projects, once they're implemented, will help prevent what we're seeing now with Lake Okeechobee discharges? Well, C43 is only 170,000 acre feet. Um, you know, you do the math and uh, I think it's somewhere around 35 to 40% of the necessary storage that's needed. So unfortunately through the years, uh, the district hasn't been able to effectively regulate consumptive use. And that's what's driving the inequity of water to the estuary in the dry season. That's why we're building a 170,000 acre reservoir at a billion dollars cost. So the trade-off was we couldn't regulate it. We couldn't do a reservation to sustain the resource. So the alternative was spend a billion dollars on a storage reservoir. So how certain am I? Well, if it's when it's finished, uh, you know, it'll attain about 35% of the needed storage in order to meet the minimum flow rule. That's not enough, and, and I wanna ask you a follow-up, and I'm gonna share my screen as I do, um, because you've talked pretty eloquently about the need for reining in pollution at its source in Florida, and the inability of the Florida legislature to maybe grasp that concept. Maybe they do grasp it, they just don't wanna do it, but how can we prevent the green water that we've seen in the past? What, what needs to happen in Tallahassee? Wow, so that's that's a real easy one. <laughs> so how do we how do we uh, mitigate the underlying root cause, which is nutrient pollution? And so you know, I think there's a, a, perhaps an attempt to do that with seven uh, Senate Bill seven twelve in terms of revising the B maps, uh, addressing biosolids, and some other things. But you know, I'll believe it when I see it. They're revising the stormwater rule, and so. The, the problem is, is that the legislature is willing to throw a lot of money at these things. But when you look at the, re the legislative reform, it's not typically not substantive enough to address the root causes. Uh, so to me, that's, that's a huge problem. That's going to require a watershed event through our legislative representatives uh, in the upcoming sessions. Uh, we just can't wait another 10 years to sort this out. We waited too long with this, revising the stormwater rule. Uh, there was clear indication that the criteria in the, the ERP and MPDES stormwater rule wasn't, wasn't effective as far back as 05, 06. So we've wasted 14 years on an ineffective rule. There's widespread consensus that the BMAPs are largely ineffective in timely reduction of the underlying causes of these uh, nutrient problems that drive the algae blooms. So it's, a, it's an insidious problem um, and the legislature is just going to have to do something way more significant than they've done already to address this problem. We've got legacy issues in the lake. You know, the legacy nutrients in the lake, uh, the internal loading exceeds all the external inputs annually by a factor of three, four, and five, depending on the nutrient you're talking about. We've got some really, really serious problems. We're not making adequate progress with BMAPs and TMDLs. So how do we fix it? You know, I'm, I'm afraid we're starting to lean towards mitigation efforts. You know, we're hearing about putting in these uh, peroxide solutions into the water to mitigate blue-green algae. Um, I don't even know if that's feasible on the scale that's necessary for red tide. You know, yeah. the tide blooms 120, 130 miles from, you know, from north to south along the west coast of the state. Uh, how are you going to mitigate that? Yeah, that's a good point, John. So I, I wanted to bring that up. There's a, an Israeli company right now stationed at the C-44 canal where the lake water enters it ready to deploy algicide. They've got a big tank set up um, and it's essentially hydrogen peroxide and they haven't had to deploy it yet because there has not been any blue-green algae coming out of the lake at the moment. Um, however, I think it's really telling that they did not set up on the west side of the state where volumes are much heavier um, because the amount of algicide that would have been needed 
is pretty hard to imagine and also raises questions about unintended consequences and Florida's kind of the land of unintended consequences. So Mike, what do you think about that? I think you might've gone out there and looked at the setup. Yeah, I did. I was out for my, I was out there about five, seven, six, seven days ago and I, I saw the flag. I, had, I thought at first it was a, uh, a family reunion picnic being set up for Israeli family. I couldn't make out what it was. And then uh, I guess a couple of days later, some of the district board members went out and had a long meeting with the folks there, the scientists there. Um, and a couple of them said this, they were really impressed with the intelligence and their approach. But, you know, it just, you need, your gut reaction when you see something like that with mitigation is, you're kidding me. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, here in Martin County, we had vacuum, we had companies come out with vacuums, boats with vacuum tanks to come out and clean the algae. Uh, you know, it's, we don't need help, help with optics. We, we don't need to, we need to look at the source of it. Uh, you know, if you read about microcysts and you read about these blooms, some of the leading scientists in the world, Paul Cox and people like that, James Metcalf say the worst thing you can do is disturb that bug. Don't disturb the algae. Don't disturb the blooms. Let it take its course. Let it get out to sea, whatever it takes. But don't disturb the bloom. Don't, don't prompt that to release the microcystin, as which what happens when you break the membrane of that cell. So we, we look at peroxide, and you, you know that it kills everything else, too. That is a beneficial plant, beneficial uh, plant, beneficial things also are harmed. You know, if anybody who's an aquarist knows, people say they use it in some applications for ponds, but, you know, it will kill the algae, make the pond look better, but it also kills, uh, kills life forms. So I, I just look at that and I wonder, yeah, by the way, I, I understand there was no bid process uh, for that company to, to choose a company. It came out of the blue on me. I, I, I just think something, uh, I think it's a waste of money and a waste of our time. We better focus our, our dollars uh, to, uh, as John said so eloquently a little while ago, to stopping the, the, the input of phosphorus, nitrogen, and pollutants from north of the lake. Um, there's, and and I, I really get, I get weary of hearing people around the lake tell me, tell me that, well, we, it's Orlando's problem, it's Orlando's fault. There's a lot of inputs between Orlando and the mouth, of the Cassinia where it enters the lake. Um, and again, Lake Okeechobee has been a eutrophic situation for a long time. As far back as 1970s, there were people hammering this problem home, saying this is, and these are bass fish from back in the 70s, I knew. They said this lake will turn upside down and become a dead apopka in 40 years. Or a little past there now, but it's not it's not looking too promising. And I yeah, don't believe in the cleanup idea. I don't. We've we've really felt like we're uh, we've been a, at a tipping point in Florida for years now. 2018 certainly felt that way. And you know, you really worry that we're gonna get past the point of no return. So to summarize some of the solutions I'm hearing, control pollution at its source right? Um, operate Lake Okeechobee in a manner that benefits and protects all Floridians, not mainly large agricultural interests south of the lake that want to control the lake supply for their irrigation. Um, and, and I'm going to toss it to a question I saw on Facebook in the last few minutes we have left, because I think this is really important. It's how can grassroots, indivi just individuals get involved and help this cause with grassroots organizations like ours? So, um, Ronaldo, I'll start it with you. Sure. Um, that's a great question. And, you know, the big one is the support uh, your tried and true organizations, the ones that are truly here to serve the public interest. Of course, you always have, you know, every waterkeeper in Florida, you have groups like Friends of the Everglades. Um, because there's so many uh, of these facade astroturf organizations that are designed, really they're just the PR campaign for polluter industries. And every polluter industry has these groups, right? If it's up north in Florida, it's uh, mosaic and they're phosphate mining down here. It's, it just happens to be sugar. Um, these groups exist. And what they do is they put out the, their facade excuses like, the run, Palm Beach County running out of water excuse, or a big one is, uh, you know, development and septic tanks and whatnot. And I want everyone to kind of look at the Lake Worth Lagoon as an example to disprove right off the face, uh, right off the bat, uh, a lot of these arguments, because, you know, take, for example, the septic tank and development or argument. Well, there's you're gonna have a hard time finding a place in Florida that's more heavily developed than Palm Beach County. And in our watershed, you look at the Eastern half 
of the Lake Worth Lagoon watershed east of the refuge. And you have everything from small horse farms to, you know, pig operations to uh, endless suburbia, you know, West Palm Beach, Royal Palm Beach, just all these houses with hundreds of thousands of septic tanks, all these things are inputting into the Lake Worth Lagoon. And the common denominator is that we don't get significant cyanobacteria blooms specifically unless we take Lake O water. So when you wanna look at the source, what is the source and, and the root cause of all these problems, look at the Western half of the Lake Worth Lagoon watershed. You know, we started by showing those pictures of, at the S352 spillway and, you know, throughout the EAA for months at a time, our watershed every year without fail is going to endure cyanobacteria bloom. And it's always going to be in that Western half until we take Lake O discharges. Only then when we take the discharges, if the cyanobacteria is there, it's going to move on to the Eastern half. So if these organiza if you have an organization that's spreading, uh, you know, we like to call them red herrings or things that aren't based on science, it's really just a distractor. These technologies that are designed to, you know, fix our problem, every water keeper on this call, I'm sure, and every water keeper can say that we've gotten regular emails and calls or at meetings, people come up and try to sell us their snake oil. Well, we have the answer. We're just going to put this in the lake or we're going to do this or we're going to use this filter. None of that works, not to the scale. I, I question if these people have even been to Lake Okeechobee because at that scale, the only thing that's going to work is stop the pollution from the source and bring back habitat so that that habitat can compete with cyanobacteria. Thanks, Ronaldo. Mike, uh, briefly, what can everyday people do to support grassroots efforts for clean water? Well, again, you know, align yourself in an organization, uh, but on the other, you know, I live in a county, you know, I look at, it, we have a very good newspaper here. It's very, very pro environment. Um, and I, I see so few um, residents raising their voices with a letter to the editor, something as simple as that. Um, you don't, I mean, the last four or five months, you could not get an environmental letter in the paper because of the election, because of COVID. Believe me, I know, I tried. <laughs> I had a letter submitted and four months later and made it in the paper. But I always tell people, you know, folks here, you have, when's the last time you talked to a legislature? When's the last time you went to a, a Zoom meeting uh, and voiced, you know, voiced your displeasure with the status quo uh, there's plenty of opportunities. You don't even have to get dressed and go down and drive to a meeting anymore if you're a little fearful about speaking in public. Now you can do it in a comfortable way from your own living room. Uh, we just don't hear enough. And I hear that from legislators over the years, too, that your fishing industry is so big. And, but we don't hear from the, the tackle shops. We don't hear from the guides. We don't have any, We don't hear the, the fur furious comeback. You know, you guys are always the talking heads. You know, the NGO folks are always there. We're always there and always will be. But I just try to get the general public to understand that, you know, not only uh, you can actually, anybody can bring a lawsuit. <laughs> you don't have to be a water keeper. You can do that. But there's just too little, too much silence in my in my uh, opinion. Um, here we are again during the discharge. Discharge is coming, and you know, through attrition, people get worn down, and that's the fear I have. Is people if through attrition, people get worn down, and they they begin to accept it. They get desensitized to this stuff happening to them year after year after year. And it's our job as water keepers um, to rally the troops and try to get build that momentum again and get people furious. They hear from too few of us. Our legislators yeah. do, you know, the other side hears too little from us. Um, uh, well, joke, we have to outspend them. We have to outspend the other side. It's so, so let me jump in there and say, when, whenever I start to get a little weary, because before I was with Friends of the Everglades, I, I wrote about these issues as a journalist for about 10 years. I think about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who founded Friends of the Everglades and lived to 108 and was tireless even in her golden years. So we've got to keep at it. Um, I'm going to give the last word to John Kasani. John, your coast, the Caloosahatchee estuary is really taking the brunt of this Lake Okeechobee discharge right now. What can folks who are really concerned do to help contribute to a solution? Yeah, thanks for asking that, Eve. The volunteers are the backbone of our program. We have a huge project area, thousand square miles of water. Uh, we train, we've trained about and educated <clears throat> about a hundred, uh, what we call volunteer rangers that are part of our program. 
Uh, they meet face to face with individual policymakers. Uh, they're they're a driving force in their community. We had we had one of our zone groups, our volunteer zone groups, establish a water quality task force within their community of three thousand people. I mean, they're doing amazing things. Could not do this by myself. So we've tried to empower them as much as we can with the tools they need to be good advocates. I guess the bottom line was we're, our arms are open. We're ready to engage anybody that wants to come and, and be part of it, be part of a team. And uh, hey, it's trial by fire now, man. The stakes are high. <laughs> we can't wait. We need to empower the residents of, of Florida to stand up and make these watershed changes to policy. Can't do it as individual water keepers. We need to empower our communities and our volunteers. Well put. I think that's a great spot to end. We've got to empower people. We have a moment right now. There's public attention and media attention on Lake Okeechobee discharges. We wish they weren't happening, but let's use this moment to rise up and fight for a solution. So I thank you all for joining us today for our clean water conversation. There's a lot more information on all of our websites, Lake Worth Water Keeper, Indian River Keeper, Calusa Water Keeper, and you can go to everglades.org to find out more about Friends of the Everglades. So Thank you all. We'll keep talking about these issues. Thanks, Eve. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys later. Good being with you.